Hello everyone, uh, this is John Buck back for another discrete time linear systems video. Uh, in this video we're going to be talking about how we can use Fourier transform properties to find the output of a, di a, a system described by a difference equation when the input is a uh, exponential signal uh, of the form we've seen before. Uh, and so uh, we're able to use Fourier transform properties and partial fraction expansions uh, to, to get the output uh, directly in an equation for all time instead of having to go through and turn the crank one step at a time. Uh, so it's very powerful that way. It takes a little more work in algebra, but it's much better than going step after step after step because we get a general equation and we can think about how it behaves. So let me show you how that works. Again, our, our topic for this video is finding the output for a difference equation uh, using Fourier transform properties. So we'll get it directly, not just a step-by-step -step thing. And so the kind of problem we're going to answer, the example I'm going to show you is, is if I have a causal LTI system whose difference equation is that y of n minus 1 half y of n minus 1 is equal to 6x of n, if the input is some signal x of n like 3 times minus 1 seventh of the n u of n, what is the output? Well, I could, uh, what would be a bad strategy here, a very painful time-consuming strategy would be to move things around up here in the equation Right, to say, well, I'm going to move this term over to the right-hand side, plug this in, and just turn the crank plugging in values over and over again. But I can get numerical values for as long as I want to stay at it, but I'll never actually get to an equation for the output unless I'm really good at seeing patterns, even in a simple equation like this with just one term in the input and a very simple first-order system like this, first-order recursive system. It can be very hard to find the patterns if you're not used to it. But what we're going to do now is a way that will get us an equation for y of n that we can, we can use to understand how the signal behaves at all time. Oh, and so I'm getting ahead of myself there. The first step is, again, similar to when we're finding h of e to the j omega, or the first thing is to find uh, h of e to the j omega, right? Because we know that the output y of e to the j omega is h of e to the j omega times x of e to the j omega, right? In the time domain, I would be convolving x of n with h of n, so I could try to find h of n and do that convolution, but that's also another really painful way to do it. A better approach is to say, let's think about why things are easier in the frequency domain. I'll get this. Well, I need to find h first, which I've done in an uh, example like this uh, in an earlier video. So I'll do it quickly here. I can say y of e to the j omega uh, minus 1 half e to the minus j omega, y of e to the j omega equals 6 x of e to the j omega. Well, to find h for this equation, I need to divide through so that I end up with h of e to the j omega is equal to y of e to the j omega over x of e to the j omega. And since this was it, this technique was in a previous video, I'm just going to sort of uh, jump to the punchline here. But when you're done, you should have 6 over 1 uh, minus a half e to the minus j omega. So that's h of e to the j omega. The other piece I need is the Fourier transform x of e to the j omega. Well, let me uh, slide down a little bit and find room for that. That one isn't too bad because this is almost like things we know on the table. right? If I do this carefully, if I took that away, this would be an a to the n u of n, which I have in the table. But if I put it back, it's just the linearity property, three times that. So I know in, in this one I can say x of e to the j omega is equal to 3 over 1 minus 1 seventh e to the minus j omega. And the way I'm doing that is I'm using the Fourier transform pair out of the tables. But if I have a to the n u of n, the Fourier transform is 1 minus or 1 over 1 minus a e to the minus j omega, as long as the magnitude of a is less than 1. Well, in this example, I would be using a is equal to minus 1 7th. Oh, so I caught my mistake here. So this is plus 1 7th in the denominator when I put in a is equal to minus 1 7th. And it's three times that because of the scaling property. So now I have the two pieces I need. Right? I can say I need h of e to the j omega, which I found here. And I need x of e to the j omega, which I have here. So I can just multiply these two things together to get y of e to the j omega. So when I do that, finding the, this type of equation, I have the output Fourier transform, y of e to the j omega, 
is going to be uh, 6 times 3 in the numerator, which is 18. And then the denominator, I'll have 1 plus 1 seventh e to the minus j omega, and 1 minus 1 half e to the minus j omega. So now I want to get from here back to the output y of n. I need to do an inverse Fourier transform, but this isn't one I'll find in the table, but it's close. We say those denominators are tempting terms. Can I take this thing I got by multiplying these two together and break it back apart into a sum of two pieces? So I want to find the numerators that would give me a sum that looks like this, because if, if I can find these two numerators, these are each easy things to solve using this formula here. Well, the answer to doing this is partial fractions. And so it's another place where partial fractions are useful. I've, you've, I've already shown it in another video. Uh, and since I've done that, I'm not going to do this one in detail. I will go, I've already worked this one out in advance. So here's my partial fraction, which is to say I have 18 times 1 plus, the denominator is 1 plus 1 seventh e to the minus j omega, 1 minus 1 half e to the j omega breaking into the sum of a and b, working all the way through it. Uh, and again, I'll, I'll sort of do this. You can freeze the video and copy stuff down if you want to for yourself. Or you could go pause the video, don't look at the partial fraction, try to do it yourself, and then come back here and check your answer if you want to practice with that. But I'll end up with something like this, where it's 4 over 1 plus 1 seventh e to the minus j omega plus 14 over 1 minus 1 half e to the minus j omega. So when I'm done with that, sort of on my scratch paper, I get, uh, make sure I copy this over, right? So I get a 4 over the 7th. So this, this term is a 4, and this term is a 14. And I can see when I put it back together, I have 1 times 14 and 1 plus 4. So the constant term would be 18. And then I get a minus 2 and plus 2 as the coefficient in front of e to the minus j omega, and they cancel out as they should. So now I'm golden. I'm, I'm lined up for, for landing on the inverse Fourier transform runway here, right? Because I'm, I'm looking to say I've got a sum of two things that are just scaled versions of something that looks like this for two different values of a, right? Just to, to break that down a little bit, again, I'm back to saying, well, this one a is minus one seventh, and this term here, I have an a is equal to plus a half. And so if I want to carry those through, maybe I'll use the colors to make it clear where each term in y of n comes from. The first term is the a's minus 1 seventh term. I'd have 4 from this numerator times minus 1 seventh to the n u of n. And then the second term I'd have plus 14, again the gain from the numerator, times 1 half to the n u of n. Okay, so now the nice feature of this, look what I've done. I've got, this thing would be, uh, tell me the value. If I want to find the output at any time, I can find it by just plugging in these ends. I don't need to turn the crank one step at a time through the difference equation. And certainly, uh, this is a fairly complicated signal. You'd have to look at it for a long time if I just had the numerical values and pull this out as the pattern. And again, this is almost the simplest example we can do. It's a first order system with a simple single term exponential input. So uh, that's all for this video, showing you another value of using Fourier transforms around systems and, and how using the frequency domain lets us get a general answer for an output for all time that would be really hard to get if we were trapped only working in the time domain. So I'll stop here, and I will see you in the next video.